Welcome to The Good Life. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, before I get into the show, first, I would like to say that this podcast is now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, I mean, there's and YouTube. So there's plenty of ways to be able to watch this or listen. Um, please do so. Please share. Please like. Please subscribe. Please follow. Um, it really helps me out. And if you like the the types of shows that I do, and if you like the types of guests that I have on, uh, let me know. And if there's somebody that you want to see on the show, please comment and uh, please hit me up and let me know that, you know, and I'll do my best to be able to get them on here. Now, on this episode, I have a living legend with me. He is, he's an actor, but he doesn't go by an actor. He calls himself a storyteller because he, that's, what he, that's what he truly is. Uh, he's a real artist. This gentleman has been in everything from Escape from Alcatraz, uh, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Seinfeld, Breaking Bad, Friends, um, Billy Madison, Barry, El Camino, A Breaking Bad Story. Um, I mean, he's been in everything, Pain and Gain, everything that you could think of. You have seen this man. And he goes by the name of Larry Hankin. So sit back and enjoy our crazy conversation and listen to the amazing stories that he tells because you won't want to miss it. All right, Larry, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you very much. Good, good to be here. Good to, good to well, here. Good to be in my home again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Good to yeah, be in it's... front of the set, in front of the internet. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to I wanted to talk to you because you, uh, I mean, you have an incredibly interesting career, and um, and I've always found your performances to be very unique and very um, very different. You know, you don't you don't really get stuck in one one type of type of thing. And I always see that you're doing multiple different things creatively. Um, and I had recently seen that you had posted this video that you had done, I think in 2012, um, in some sort of club and, and you were, Oh, the checker talking, club, me telling the story. Yes. The sometimes Jones fable. Yeah. That's, I love doing that. That that's was my favorite thing, but you can't do that because of the COVID, but yeah. uh, that's, that's what I do. I'm not an actor. Okay. The, the, you're, the, you're a storyteller? I'm a storyteller, yeah. I, well, I define myself uh, as a stand-up social anthropologist, but <laughs> that's <Okay>. personal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm a storyteller. That's, uh, you know, I just the money was really good in Hollywood, and I, and I didn't understand the difference so, uh, when I was younger mm. you know they said hey let's go to Hollywood I I fought it I, you know well, first I was in Second City and that was great I was a stand-up comedian and then I started to get into critical thinking you know comedy mm -hmm. you know uh, Lenny Bruce Richie Pryor mm. Bell Barth Red Fox <laughs> oh man <laughs> and uh it, it wasn't, uh, I, I had two crowds. I had my crowd, uh, you know, uh, I was opening for like uh, Miles Davis, the Kings, uh, uh, the Love and Spoonful, all the rock bands. And then I started opening for like, you know, uh, the, the Playboy Club and the Kingston Trio. And people started coming at me with beer bottles upside down in their hands. Get the fuck off the stage. <laughs> so I had two audiences and... Uh, I didn't understand what was going on because I was, I mean, my favorite guy was Lenny Bruce. I mean, I, mm. I grew up on Lenny Bruce and, and George Carlin and Richie Pryor and stuff. But uh, I, those are the critical thinkers. And, and once I started to do that, cause I, I just morphed. In other words, I was just going with what I felt like. I, I had no idea that cursing on stage and talking about, sex, drugs, and rock and roll could get you arrested. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't even doing drugs. That's what I kept telling the cops. I'm not doing drugs yet. Yeah. <laughs> yet. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man. Because <laughs> that's what I thought Lenny and uh, the, the, the comedians who were being pulled off the stage because they were doing drugs, not 
because they were cursing or talking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. But I was wrong. So I couldn't take it. I mean, you know, the cops thing. I, I was a middle-class Jewish kid who was just having fun. I, that's what I was having. It's just fun. Yeah. And people were paying me for doing what I did in high school. You know, I won funniest in high school two years in a row. Figured, hey, it's easy. Yeah. No sweat. But it's, it's, it's not easy. And so I, Hollywood, you know, everybody, all my friends were going down to Hollywood. And all my stand-up friends, all, all my comedian friends were going to Hollywood. Hmm. So I did too. I mean, I didn't think it was any different. Yeah. But oh, it's totally different. I mean, it's. I, I mean, I was just blind. I was up in San Francisco with the committee, improvising. So Hollywood was another country. I, oh, I'm sure. I didn't pay attention, and I wasn't interested in it. And my, my interest was not in acting. I loved improvising. I loved doing stand up. I would take off maybe two, three weeks or a month from uh, improvising to go do nightclub work. You know. And, so I had the, the, the best of both lives. I was improvising. And, and in improvising, it's not like a stage play where you, you have a stand-in or mm -hmm. somebody replace you, but they have to learn your words. No, uh, we, we could take over anybody's part at any time. You know, if, if, if you couldn't be the interviewer this week, well, then I'll be the interviewer this week. You know, I may not be as good as you, but who cares? The guy who I'm interviewing is much funnier than <laughs> me being interviewed by you. So it all worked out, you know. So, and then I was the only one left of my, of my people, my Man. friends. So they were all in Hollywood making great money. So I ca ca couch surfed for a very short time and and then, you know, I, I got these sitcom things, you know, and I was funny and it was short. Uh, the parts were short. I didn't have to memorize a lot of stuff. But then I started getting popular and the money was going up. So I just lost track of who I was. Mm -hmm. uh, really, I mean, that, that's, I was making a lot of money and I felt like I was dying. I really? mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I wasn't dying, but I was getting very depressed and I didn't know why. And it was because I wasn't doing what, what I loved doing and what I wanted to do, yeah. but the money. And then that's how they trap you, by the way. They pay you a lot of money. Be very suspicious when your salary gets above what you need for rent, food, and clothing in your car. Mm. If you have extra money, mad money, yeah. and you're taking trips and stuff, you're in a very, you're starting to, Go into the red zone. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. And because here's what happens. Yeah. The money starts to dry up. And mm -hmm. you've got rent, food, clothing, car payments, insurance, a girlfriend, a kid, maybe a mortgage. And you're in danger. Now you have to take anything that you get your greedy. No, you're, you're drowning little hands on. And I, I, I learned that really fast. Mm. Because I, 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 uh, I don't care if I'm fired. Because I'm a single guy. Basically, that's, that's my excuse. Mm -hmm. But I really don't care if I'm fired. Because uh, I, I was homeless for a year which gave me a lot of stand-up material, a lot of <laughs> uh, stand-up uh, social anthropological uh, <laughs> critical thinking yeah. uh, stuff. So I've always kept that in the back of my mind. I mean, I, I, I was uh, homeless because I was mistakenly evicted. Um, I just didn't pay attention. I mean, I had the money. I, I was working at the time. I just went to another city to write a screenplay with somebody. Mm. And he said it would be three weeks so I could come back. I didn't have my, uh, I was living on a, on a little tiny boat off of uh, Sausalito in, in, in San Francisco and on San Francisco Bay in the shadow of the um, Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, uh, on a little boat. I mean, it wasn't like I was living on a houseboat. I was yeah. living on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, wait, wait, I got to get rid of this. Uh, so I, my, my rent was $150 a month. And all I had to do was row in. It was a very tiny boat, maybe about as big as somebody's 
bedroom. Mm. <laughs> Maybe I'm okay. going to it was just, uh, And uh, so I went to, to another town for three weeks, but I was there for two months. And what I would do every month, is just row in. They gave you a little boat with the boat, <laughs> a little rowboat with your boat uh, for $150 a month. You row into the dock and I would just pay her cash. There was a lady who lived on the dock in a little old house uh, on the dock. So I just row in, I pay her the $150 and row back out of my house. But when you're not there for two months, you don't row in. I figured, well, she, you know, she knows me. I'm a, my stuff is on there. I'm not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But when I came back, I, she, I didn't know this. I noticed that her hair was never combed. She always come to the door in a bathrobe and her hair was like crazy, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I always thought it, well, and then one day I come back and I row out to my little boat and uh, nothing is there. It's bare. It's empty. Like the day before I moved in and I rode back and now I knocked on the door, you know, <clears throat> I had the cash in my hand. I had even a tip for her because I had gone, been gone mm. for two months and I didn't pay my rent. Yeah. She had a big tip. And uh, this guy who I had never seen comes to the door, uh, older gentleman. Mm -hmm. And I said, where's the lady? She says, uh, she's not here. Who are you? I go, who are you? She's, <laughs> <laughs> she, well, I'm her husband. Who are you? I, I'm the guy with the, the boat out, oh, over there. You know, it's only 50 feet out. I'm the, I'm the guy. That, oh, you're the guy. Where the hell were you for two months? Where, where's my stuff? Where's the lady? You know, says, oh, well, that's my wife. She's at the doctor's now. You know, she's uh, a, a, little, a little insane. She's crazy. You know that. No, I don't know that. I don't know anything. Where's my stuff? And she says, well, one night she rode out there. You didn't pay your uh, rent for two months. And she just rode out there one night. I tried to stop her and she threw everything overboard. Oh, my what? God. All my clothes, my sleeping bag, my mattress, uh, my radio. There was one wire from the dock to the boat. That was my electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, my records, my books, oh, my writing. Everything overboard, empty. The the um, so I was evicted, uh, and then I lived in my car for a year. I was evicted, and I had to buy a car. I didn't have a car; I had a motorcycle because hmm. I lived on a boat. You, if you have a boat, you get a motorcycle. You know that's <laughs> yeah. what you do. Yeah, just and uh, so I, I bought a car from a friend, a junky old vw green cream bus you know the old 60s buses vw buses yep. well, i had one but it was emptied out i paid five dollars for it it was totally <laughs> empty no cloth no no uh seats nothing just it gutted. looked like a delivery van yeah it was just metal and then one seat for the driver which was very rickety and if you rode with me you sat uh, a shotgun on a wooden uh, uh milk crate <laughs> And that, that was my home. Now, I did that for a month. I paid him. And then and I had enough money to rent an apartment, another apartment. Mm -hmm. But I was living in my car for, for a month. And I was doing okay. I had just worked out where to go to the bathroom, where to get phone calls, where I could take a shower, uh, all that stuff. And I didn't tell anybody. Nobody where I worked, I was working in the committee. We were making, I don't know, $200 a month or something, a, a week or something like that. So I was okay. But I thought, no, let's just see where this goes. I just hmm. wanted to stay living homeless for as long as I could do it. You know, that wow. was, uh, I did it for a month, you know, because I was, you know, bereft of any kind of, I mean, it just happened so suddenly, you know, yeah. you have nothing. She just threw it all overboard. Interesting thing, a year later, over a year later, because I had already rented, I lived there for a year. A year and a half later, when I was in an apartment, I had all these friends and I was in the community. I go to a party, maybe it was a Christmas party, I don't know, Thanksgiving party, whatever it was. And this uh, girlfriend of another friend of mine shows up. She had moved, she was living in, we all knew each other from San Francisco, but in that year and a half that I was ev evicted, lived, homeless and got another apartment everybody had kind of got a little more money and spread out so she was living up north on the bay mm. she was living on the water but north mm -hmm. and i go where did you get that shirt i say to my 
friend's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And she says, oh, it was washed up on the shore. I got it. I found it about, I don't know, about three months ago. I said, that's no my shirt. <laughs> and I bought it in Asila, Africa, three years ago. Oh my God. It was God. dumped overboard and you found it. That's a, and it was wow. such a unique shirt because it was it. African. It was made by some African. Yeah, it had to be yours. So that it had, I mean, it was in Africa. It was from <laughs> Africa. You didn't buy that. It was a tag. It was from Africa. So it was obviously mine. And I said, that's my shirt. And she said, well, it's mine now. And I said, you got it. Wow. If you have it more than two months, it's yours. Jeez. But that was, that's a miraculous, miraculous. That's insane. Yeah. But but anyway, so that's that's uh, how I got into show business, and that's how they fool you. I mean, I started out telling you how they fool you with money. So yeah. be very careful when you start to get rich. Okay. Because when the rug is pulled out from you, yeah. the source of your money, yeah. it's the money. You're in deep water, especially. Now, because I am single, you know, I don't have a lot of these triggers. I mean, I've lived with uh, two... Well, actually, I've lived with three women in, in my life over a long period of time, mm -hmm. so two to three years. And each one of them, I didn't ever realize it when it happened. But in looking back, I go, holy cow, that's amazing that I didn't notice that. All three had little kids. All three had one child. Really? So I've raised three different children. <laughs> one, one from two to four and a half. One from uh, about five till six seven and a half and then two the last one was two i raised from 15 to 17 and a half and another 17 to uh, and 18 16 until 18. Man, so, so you've basically so you've basically had the full experience of well, yeah, you know, in sections, you know, yeah. let me take a breather, let me take a year off, <laughs> let me you know, find another girlfriend, collect my thoughts a little bit, yeah, collect my thoughts, <laughs> let me try a little older, you know, see how that goes. <laughs> You know, well, let's try 16. Let's try teen. What's that going to be like? Okay. Like, oh, you know what? I'm not really feeling the teenager. Let's go back to the kid, to the younger. And, <laughs> no, you know, no. I just that was a, a fun time. A sabbatical. Let me <laughs> let me see if I can just make it on my own. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So, so, but, so, but I did feel the tension when I was raising the two young kids. You know, mm. you do feel. You know, when the, when the money starts to slow down. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's not you anymore. Uh, I never thought that way, or never thought that I would think that way. It, it's a, I, I guess it's a natural. I, I guess if you're normal, it's kind of natural. I'm not, I'm not normal, but I mean, is anybody? Well, what is normal? No. No. <laughs> by the way, by the way, there is no fucking normal. Exactly. Give me exactly. a break, will you? The new normal is a new strange. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll oh yeah. Get used to. Most definitely. Oh, yeah. Okay. You, you get you can but you can get comfortable. You but... can get comfortable. You yeah. can get what's what's the the, the the danger zone? Comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, the get comfort, into a zone. comfort zone. Comfort yep. zone. You can get comfortable, but don't yep. get into it. And then you get stuck so, and you get complacent. Um Oh man, do you ever. So so what so what made you decide to I've got like it in my said, head. Because like you said, you had <laughs> well, because like you said, you had the money to get a place, but you were like, you know what? Let's just see where this goes. Let's. See I was young I and crazy, and I could live <laughs> forever, man. Come on, <laughs> give me a break. No, I mean that's seriously. When I was young, I was immortal, and I could live forever. And that was not like some subset in the back of some, you know, lizard brain. No, uh -huh. that was a conscious thought. I mean, I will be this way forever. Yeah. I mean, I could do things. Yeah. You know, I could jump on top of a fire hydrant, you know, which is only that high. Mm -hmm. But I could take a running jump. Yeah. And jump onto the top of that and balance on one foot. I could do that, man, when I was Jeez. when I was young and immortal. Well, you I'm know? young. I don't think I could you, do that. Uh, but <laughs> well, yeah, but I would practice it. Mm -hmm. I would practice it because 
if I get hurt, I'll get better. Yeah. I mean, it's just that simple. <laughs> okay. That, I mean, that's, you a, know, that's a great way to look at it, though. trying to jump on top of a fire hydrant, <laughs> it can go very badly. Let go very you, badly. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of parts that are <laughs> not covered uh, by insurance. <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, so so I... Um, I was indestructible, so I lived. I, I said, "Let me see how this turned out," because I liked. I didn't like challenges that uh, that were that were coming at me, but I would readily accept. And uh, I don't know where this comes from. I would readily accept any danger I was in. Hmm. In okay. other words, if if it was okay, it's too late. I'm here. You know. Yeah. I I I didn't do this, but say I I broke my collarbone or something. Mm-hmm. No, I can handle that. It, if somebody said, no, if you jump across that, you're going to break your collarbone, I would start to worry and probably break my collarbone because I was worried about m- missing. In mm-hmm. other words, the fear got in the way of the pure act. Yeah. So um, uh, that was a learning process. Where yeah. uh, If I was relaxed enough and cool enough and, you know, was physically capable, because uh, here's the thing. Uh, the committee made you uh, practice and rehearse and stay physically fit because mm. we had to use our entire bodies. Yeah. We, we were actors. So if somebody, you know, if you were improvising and you had to do a somersault while you were improvising, then you could do the somersault. You know, you didn't have to fake it. Mm-hmm. So we did physical exercises too. So, I mean, I, I wasn't just, you know, some schmuck saying, Hey, I'm going to jump on that fire pole, <laughs> you know, the fire hydrant. I, mean, I I knew that I could do it because I had practiced and done other things because of the committee. They kept you in shape, mm. which was, a, a, you know, a blessing. Yeah. But then, you know, you go down to Hollywood and then I wasn't in the committee and I wasn't practicing. And then I was just some normal guy who could get fired. But I never had fear because of that memory of, I, I was homeless. I lived in the car. I know how to do this. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, and, and every time I was with a kid, no, I couldn't do that then that would kick in and not voluntarily <laughs> you know i thought hey, i'm still immortal and i can still do whatever i want but n- no uh it, it it seeps in it's weird because uh, i never thought i would be that way yeah. i never thought i would be like a father mm. no you, you, all of a sudden you care i see these uh, fathers you know uh, on television or in the news you know uh, with a new kid or protecting the kid, he jumps in front of a something or he go, and I go, wow, that's amazing that a father would, would, would do that. And then you, you, you're with a kid and that's, you know, the kid tries to cross the street. Whoa. Hey, it's just like instinct. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah. And you go, I don't oh, have kids God. yet. So, so I don't know that yet, but, but well, you don't have to worry. I I, I, I'm saying I if you, if you're normal, if you're cool, if you're okay, you know, if you can keep a job, if you have a girlfriend, if you're steady, if you're nice, no, then, then everything works, man. It's all in there. It, yeah. it, it's all, you were born with that shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the stuff that gets in the way that makes you not, not care, not be friendly, not, be angry mm-hmm. you know then i mean a be become angry you know yeah if you're cool it's there you're even smarter than 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 you are you know that don't you mm-hmm. yeah. you are way smarter than you are than you think <laughs> yeah 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 i mean if you discover that uh, as you go on oh wow i didn't i didn't know i knew that or i didn't know i could do that or i didn't know that that i knew it yeah i mean i'm only 25 and i've had moments you're like immortal that. you can live yeah. forever <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah exactly um no but 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 i've had moments where it and it's funny because i've told my 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 parents this but i've and especially my dad i've said you know i never realized how much i actually retained until i just know how to do some things and and i'm like Oh wait! A, actually, I remember that one conversation that my dad told me about this, right, or my mom told me in. about that, and I didn't think I was paying attention because I didn't want to listen. I was like, oh, "I'm not worried about exactly, that. man." But it but goes, it goes in. in. Everything goes in. You gotta you gotta understand that everything goes in. It's getting it out. Mm. <laughs> it's all in there, man. You are a recording machine. Yeah. 
you are biologically, but accessing it, that, that's the cool thing. Yeah. Uh, but the people, you know, you, you see people who are, blow your mind with their uh, intellect or their whatever, their mm -hmm. amazingness. Yeah. And you go, wow, but they're just accessing it. You yeah. got that. But uh, fear, parents, all those tapes in there. Now, it's, now, now you're a tall guy. You're you're six four, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for I'm, a while now, anyway. <laughs> so I'm also six foot four, um, and my question to you, the reason why I bring that up, is because I I've, I've wondered has has your height affected yes the roles that you've gotten or haven't gotten all my life. Yeah. First of all, I didn't have a well. I didn't have a good childhood. Uh, my parents, my mom was cool. Dad was the most uncool father I've ever experienced. <laughs> well, oh, that's, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, no, you know, you 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 either deal with it or, or get over it, or you don't. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it can be dealt with. Mm -hmm. It's work, but it can be dealt with. Uh, so uh, a lot of the things that went in were, were bad information, and I retained that. It all goes in. Yeah, he was telling me, you know, um, some of it was, was good. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I don't have much to say about uh, parenting, though. Uh, uh, I, I, well, I, what was I got kind of lost my thought there. So, so ha has your has your height uh, um, oh, the height. ever okay, stopped the you from getting thing. roles, height. or ever stopped right. you from get, you know? Or got you roles. Yeah, it started of... with my parents. So because of my parents, that's what I was explaining. Because of my father. I never wanted to be tall. Uh, hmm. uh, I never wanted to be known. And, and, and uh, I, I would, you know, like this. I would sit in the back of the classroom. I, I just was, I became shy. I became sh shy. Mm -hmm. But I was hunched over. So that was the first height thing. That my father would always say, hey, don't, don't hunch over. You know, put, throw your shoulders back. Mm -hmm. Now he was right, but the other shit he was doing was just causing me. <laughs> so I would go, you know, for five seconds, over. but the rest of the day I'd be like this. So then the second no no was when you get into cool into class. I don't know if they do it now, but back in my day, it was all size places. You know, line up. We're going to recess. Line up, size places. Shortest first, mm -hmm. tallest last. Mm -hmm. I was always last. So there was a second boom. Why the fuck was I want to be? I want to stand. How about me standing in the middle? <laughs> Get in the back there. Okay, so I'm sitting in the back. I'm standing in the back. I'm hunched shoulder. Now I get to uh, and so stand up was a a a, a, a free zone. Mm, yeah. Nobody cared. You know yeah. they couldn't because I wasn't on stage with anybody else. So it was just me and the microphone. You know mm -hmm. the, the guy before me would have to go. You know, move the microphone up, or I would. But that was the only sign. But when I got to Hollywood, now another thing started to happen. So now I'm starting to stand up. Now I'm getting my, you know, myself back, my, uh, my, uh, I don't know, my ego back. Uh, in the committee, we're doing good work. I'm, you know, I'm doing good work. Nobody cares whether I'm tall or short in the committee, or in Second City. Then they get to Hollywood, and now I hear. Well, you're very good, but I think uh, you're too tall for the star. You're taller than the star. Mm. And in those days, you couldn't be taller than the star. Yeah. Well, 6'4", all the stars were short with big heads. <laughs> like 5'10", with a massive head. With a massive head. Yeah. Uh, so I couldn't, so I, I didn't get jobs because I was tall. Mm. So it, it really was a very bad thing to be tall, yeah. you know. Uh, and, and also to be funny and tall, uh, in Hollywood, you, you know, because my, I would call myself a mocker as opposed to be funny. Mm, okay. You know, I, well, I'm a mock. Well, you know, what do you do? Well, I, I mock things. I'm a mocker. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's a good so way if you're it. tall and you're mocking things, you start fights is what happened. <laughs> so I would get into a lot of fights because I was tall and funny. Mm. If you're short and funny, uh, you, you, you know, people will protect you. They yeah. will pick on you. 
your Charlie Chaplin, you yeah. know, it, it pays off. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, so that's the, the, the tall and the short of it. Okay. Yeah. When I was, when I was going to college at uh, Michigan State University, that was when Batman versus Superman was filming there. Yeah. And, and I remember um, I was just kind of getting into film because I, I had started in, in musical theater um, going all through school. And so I wanted to transition into film and try that out. And I remember seeing just an extras casting for Batman versus Superman. It was right on MSU's campus. And I said, well, I live on campus. This would be perfect. I could just walk there, right? Yeah. So I submitted for it and um, and they liked what, you know, they liked my photo and everything like that. They said, okay, can you send us your size card? So I sent my size card and they responded back. They said, you know, unfortunately um, we'd love to have you, but we can't have someone taller than both Batman and Superman in the scene. <laughs> And so it took everything I had not to message back. Okay, well then just give me the suit then. I'll just do yeah, it. That's fine. Right. <laughs> um, but instead I messaged them back and I said, well, I said, well, can you put me in a chair? And they said, it's yeah. that kind of scene. <laughs> I was like, oh. you know, but that, that was. You can't that, be taller than Batman and Superman. Yeah. Yep. How dare you? They couldn't have, because I mean, I mean, Ben Affleck, he's six foot three, right? But but Henry Cavill, he's only about six foot one. You How get tall me, are you? I'm six foot four. Wow, you, you, wow, that's amazing. And I'm and I'm I'm on the thinner side, so I look taller than I am. Wow, yeah, right, me too. You know, you know? thin. Yeah, and so uh, and, and especially then, I was about twenty pounds lighter then. So. Um, so yeah, I and man, I I wanted to, so so when I saw the movie and and I had a lot of friends that were extras in that movie. I had a friend who had a few lines in that movie, played a cop and everything. And um, and I remember seeing the movie and I saw that scene and I saw someone sitting in a chair in the background. <laughs> and I was he, so mad. that's my part <laughs> exactly. I was like, that's my chair. I could have been <laughs> sitting there. Um, but yeah, yeah. So no, I, they're they're really the casting uh, situation is, is is very demeaning at at, <laughs> at best. I yeah. mean, it's just they don't like that. I mean, that's that's silly. You're taller than Sue. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's true nowadays, but nowadays because of all these monsters and sci-fi, mm. you can be any size now. You you can yeah. be a little hero and a, and a big monster. And yeah. it makes you more forward. I mean, that was the whole key to Chaplin. He always picked formidable opponents. Everybody was taller than him. He was so short. Yeah. So I don't see why they don't use that same, you know, uh, thinking. Well, and what's uh, funny is now they're start all a lot of their superheroes that they're casting now are all tall. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so, so you can't be tall. You just can be as tall as. But yeah. But hopefully, yeah, you know, ho hopefully they're they're kind of paving the way for us tall guys to to be able to get some of those juicier roles, you know. Um, well, I can't. I don't care. I can't be a hero anymore. Although I never wanted to be a hero, mm. but I can't be a hero anymore because of. Well, it's not that you're too tall, Larry. You're just too old. <laughs> so I am writing some some old heroes. Okay. I that made right. my my one screenplay is. Um, about this old 70 year old hero hmm. i mean i mean a, a guy who does her who wants to be heroic let me let me put it okay that way. I okay mean, he's not he doesn't fly he's not that's supernatural super okay he's not supernatural but he just wants to be and it's a comedy because well yeah he's old. of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> but but it doesn't stop him i mean it's basically i i'm, I'm rewriting um don quixote is basically what i'm doing Okay. He, well, but, that's my favorite. He was the funniest man. Don Quixote is my favorite book, by the way. Okay. So Are you so, going to say something? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was going to ask you to tell um, to tell me about Emmett, about your character. Well, Emmett, Emmett, that, Emmett that's Demon. my hero. That's um, he came into being because I noticed something when I was actually when I was in my thirties. I noticed it started with the women. I noticed that women actresses, when they became 35, you know, when they looked 35, I didn't know how old they were. If they mm -hmm. looked 35, maybe 40, between 35 and 40. If they looked between 35 and 40, 
the actresses, movie actresses, became sitcom moms. And I thought, what the fuck, man? Hmm. And they never went back to the movies. If you notice, like the, the prime example is Lucille Ball, although she became a billionaire. She never went back to movies, except to do a Lucille Ball Desi Arnaz movie, which really wasn't a movie. It was a film sitcom that they made a, a movie that they released as a movie. But yeah. I mean, the sitcom situations, it wasn't a movie, it was a sitcom. Mm -hmm. But Lucille Ball is the only one who could do that. The others never went back. They became sitcom moms and then retired. And I thought, and then I started to watch, well, wait a minute, if that's happening to the women, What's going on with the men? So then I started to watch all the sitcoms and all the sitcom dads were former movie actors. And mm. I go, whoa, I'm an actor now, but I don't like that at all. I don't want to be a sitcom dad, man. That's the worst. They're all yeah. idiots. Yeah. We, 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 which, I, which I've dads never understood. Are idiots. I've never, I've, I've never understood that, why that's, that's always the go-to. Uh, well, because in, uh, I'll dance. tell you what, it's producers. They want to, uh, they want to sell pizzas. They want to, they want to get uh, uh, asses and eyeballs, mm. asses on seats and eyeballs at the, you know, in the, in, in the movie theaters or at home. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they design things to not insult anybody. So if you have the wife as the idiot, mm -hmm. you are going to insult women because they're treated like idiots in the first place. To yeah. actually put their face in it is gonna be problems. Yeah. But if you call men idiots, even though they are idiots, they are in charge and don't know that they're idiots or won't admit it. Mm. So you can have the dads as idiots and let the wives have the good ideas or the kids. Mm. And that's, now that's my take on it, but okay. that's what I think is going on. I can see that though. Yeah, that, that makes so sense. So I decided to design something where I was too old, quote unquote, or maybe too <laughs> tall, or maybe too Jewish, <laughs> or maybe too white. You know, or whatever, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to be in a movie anymore. I decided to, I will grow into my character if I design an old character now, which is what Charlie Chaplin did. He designed his little tramp when he was 17 and a half, maybe 18. Mm. He became Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. His first movie, I think he was 17 and a half or 18. And he played a, a, I don't know, a guy with a top hat and a waistcoat, mm -hmm. a, a comic character. But that was his first movie. And then uh, one day he decided to be a little older and a little trampier. So he got, he got that, he got the costume he, he wore for the rest of his life. But he was 17 playing a 35-year-old bureaucrat, really. Mm -hmm. If you look at his costume, yeah. he always had a hat. Yeah. I think he had a vest, but he had a waistcoat on. Yeah. And he had pants that were too big, but they were dress pants. They were suit pants. They were too big. And the shoes were too big. But it was the middle class bureaucrat of 1930. Yeah. So he he hmm. w was smart. He had he designed a costume that he could stay in for a couple of years. As he grew older, he just got to be 35. But then when he did Monsieur Verdot which is when he was like 55 or 60 and still wanted to be in movies, mm -hmm. he couldn't do that stuff. He couldn't jump on a fire hydrant and stand on it anymore. Yeah. He wasn't a ballet dancer. It was a good movie. It was a good movie, but it was a little old fashioned and, and he was tr trying a little too hard and he was never again as popular as when he grew up. So I designed Emmett to do that, but I had started late. I had started when I was around, 55, I designed Emmett, I, you know, because that was, I was a right for a, a dad, a yeah. dad in a sitcom. Yeah. <laughs> I said, no, no way. I got to get out of this. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, again, I was making too much money to go back to stand up now because mm. I'd been away for so long. I'd have to start at a lower salary. 
yeah. get new material. It, it would take too long. So I thought, okay, I'll stick with movies. I'll just so I designed Emmett after Don Quixote. Don Quixote was about well, <clears throat> probably when it was written in 15, I don't know, 74 or whatever it was. He, he was alive at the, he was reading Shakespeare. Cervantes was reading Shakespeare at the time. So uh, they, were, they, were, they were alive at the same time. Uh, two different countries, no internet, but he was reading Shakespeare. Uh, so Cervantes decided to write uh, Don Quixote, a funny guy who was at that time probably around, I bet, 50, 55, I bet. But nowadays he would be 70, because in those days, mm. <laughs> you, you were, I was pretty old, 55, if you were 55, yeah. you were ancient. So, so I, that's where I got the idea for Emmett. And I thought, okay, I'll make him, uh, um, I, I had a, I, I said, well, Chaplin had a cane. I was trying to look for the, for the, the stick, the prop. Mm -hmm. Don Quixote had Resonante and pa, uh, uh, oh, who's his? Uh, Sancho Panza and a mule. So he had like a lot of props, you know, old rickety things, you mm -hmm. know, uh, to get jokes with. Falling off his horse, you know, trying to catch the mule. You know, uh, the, the fat Sancho Panza who was giving him really good advice that was totally against his, you know, bizarreness. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what can I do? Uh, what can I do for a horse? What can I do for Sancho Panza? What can, okay, well, the cane. I can't use the cane. All right, a motorcycle. If I put him on a motorcycle, an old motorcycle, that would be Resonante, a really old motorcycle. Where can I get Sancho Panza from? Give him a sidecar. Let him pick up hitchhikers. <laughs> uh, a, new, a new Sancho Panza each week. Yes. So that's what I did, you know. Uh, because the two motorcycles, you know, like that's, uh, you know, Punch and, you know, the <clears throat> uh, the um, California Highway, the Highway Patrol, California, you know, Punch and those, the sitcom, the, no, well, not sitcom, the, the episodic mm -hmm. cop thing, the cop, two cops on motorcycles. Yeah. And then, okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. So then I made him uh, an ex motor, uh, an ex parking enforcement officer. <laughs> so I had him on a motorcycle already. He was kind of, a, a cop thing where he would get these ideas. See, Cervantes had a couple of chapters to build up where this insanity of he was going to change the world mm -hmm. by being a cop of the world. He could build that. I, I only had 10 pages <laughs> or, or in a, in a, my film shorts, I did three film shorts. Yeah. I only had to make a page to set up the insanity. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, uh, Quick thing is he's an ex uh, uh, parking enforcement officer who crashed his motorcycle, lost his mind, lost his memory. He and and, and an outlaw biker tells him, "No, no, you're you're an outlaw, man," because <laughs> he had the you know he was also very uh, didactic, you know, and he always telling people what to do and blah blah blah, and sticking yeah. his nose into people. So I said, "Okay, man, you know, <clears throat> no, you're an outlaw." Which is what outlaws are, really. Yeah. <laughs> They're idiots who, <laughs> I mean, you know, outlaws are very romantic. But the definition of outlaw is an insane bad guy. I don't understand that, where that, how that became such a, uh, you know, a, a title on a shining hill. <laughs> oh, man, I'm an outlaw, man, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that's how Emmett came to to become a full human being. And then I had enough money. Uh, I was going to get out. Uh, I, I was 55. I was going to get out of show business because I saw it coming. I saw the end coming. I needed a little time to get my act together, my stand up. And I'll do just, I'll blow all my money. All, all my mm. money, yeah. A lot of, not, not all of it, but a lot of it on three episodic Emmett Demas, the outlaw Emmett Demas uh, film shorts. And I entered them into uh, uh, festivals and they went all over the world, man. These are really popular. I got, uh, um, well, I was trying to follow, uh, I don't know how to say this. 
how to squeeze it in, but it just popped into my head. I got a, uh, an Academy Award nomination for a film short that I did when I first got to Hollywood. Wow. Um, because it was cheap then, and mm. uh, I had money left over, and um, I was couch surfing. Mm. So uh, any money I got from a sitcom- You could put right into- I could put into the movie. I just saved it. Yeah. And when I would decided to get- Oh, no, and, and to that movie, uh, it was like, Ten thousand dollars, I think, at the time, wow. and I, I got an Academy Award <laughs> nomination. So uh, I thought, well, you know, someday I'll just, you know, meanwhile I'll be doing my my sitcoms and my movies, and I'll be saving up money, and I'll get girlfriends, and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And then when I get to be fifty five, I'll have this money to make whatever I want to do. And then when I'm fifty five, I had the money. So I just blew it all on three film shows. They went around the world and I, I almost got another Academy Award and uh, almost, you know, but it did get a lot of awards all yeah. over the world. So now I'm writing the film to it right now. Mm. I just finished it, as a matter of fact, uh, last night. Really? Very much. Yeah. So this, hey. is, uh, I'm, I'm, this is the party right now. Yes. This is yes. This is, last night. this is the celebration. It. Yeah, this is a celebration. So it's called the outlaw. It's called <laughs> it's called the outlaw, and it's the, the where he has gone now that I did the three. I did those in uh, 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2015. Mm. It took those four years to get those three done and out. So, wow. uh, and then I took another shot at movies for a while get a little more money back and 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 now uh, i use that money to just stay sequestered for a year and a half mm -hmm. uh in other words i started writing these two screenplays when COVID hit but i was already sequestered writing i'm a you know instant gratification kind of guy yeah in other words yeah. i want to get to the end i don't care i'll sit yes. here until <laughs> i would just leave to get supplies you know <laughs> uh and, and food and stuff and blah 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 uh, but meanwhile, the COVID was there and I, I didn't, it didn't bother me because, oh man, I could type the whole day, you know, <laughs> and everybody yeah. was Zooming, so nobody was calling too much. Yeah. So, and then I finished yesterday, but we're still in COVID. So now I have to deal with COVID now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, because I don't have anything else to do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of weird now. Everybody's used to it. But I tell you, it's PTSD uh, time. I mean, I think everybody's getting PTSD because they're just, well, it's called cabin fever in the old yes. days. Oh, yeah. It's cabin oh, yeah. fever. That's what yeah. we're getting. It's PTSD. Well, Shell shock. well I know out because because you're are, you're in Los Angeles. Is that correct? Uh, Marina Del Rey, Santa, Santa Monica. Uh, LA. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So things are a lot tighter there. Oh, man. I know. Then because I'm here in Michigan. Um, and How is it there? It's not bad. There, there are things that have opened up. Um, businesses are starting to get going oh, really? again, which is which is great because the businesses really needed it. There's been a lot yeah. of businesses that have shut down um, just around oh, where I live, yeah. um, and uh, so yeah. I mean, it's it's starting to it's starting to pick up again. But I know I know out in but here it's everything is closed and uh, you can't even eat on the street. There's, yeah, you get arrested no just for walking around. You know, yeah, it's it's crazy. Um, so. Uh, so you said you went back to movies. What was it like to to return to Old Joe for El Camino? Well, that was that was fun. In, in yeah. other words, there, there's two things that I do. I do for fun, and then I do for money. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's things that I won't do for money. Uh, so uh, the, the things that I do for money are kind of now far between. I I, I really have. You know, once you once you leave, it's very hard to get get back in unless you were a star. And but I again, I'm very naive. When I left in 2011, um, 20 no no 2015. When I left in 2015 16. When I left in 2016, I dropped out. I didn't think I was retiring, but I did drop out. But the wrong thing I did was I gave up my agent. Uh, because I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm just going to work on, on writing now and, and my own little films. Yeah. So I gave, I, you know, it's not, it's not personal. It's just personal. Yeah, 
Yeah. So uh, uh, when I wanted to get back last year, or no, a couple of no, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I've been I've been writing really. So I, I would do movies for friends. In the five years, I've done you know three or four movies for friends or little films or whatever. But they would call me and I'd say, "Hey, you want to do this?" Yeah. Mm-hmm. But. I haven't worked in, in movies, but now that I want to get back into movies, I don't have an agent, so it's really hard. And trying to get a um, uh, a writing agent is really harder because the world is writing screenplays now and sending them all to Hollywood. Yeah. So there's just millions of screenplays going through the internet and, uh, uh, and uh, just the mails. <clears throat> so it's hard to get somebody to read your stuff. Even friends have stopped reading stuff yeah. now. So, but you know, that's, that's how it is now. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and to kind of talk about a little bit about the comedy stuff. Um, I grew up on Jerry Lewis. Yeah, me too. I was a big, big Jerry and still am a big Jerry Lewis fan. Well, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> so, well, no. not anymore, unfortunately, <laughs> but in terms of being able to rewatch his work and watch the stuff that him and Dean did together. Oh, okay. Let me ask you a question about that. Yeah. Yeah. Bother me. Okay. Um, have you seen the, the, the King of Staten Island, Apatow? I have not. Film? No, but I've heard I, it. I would like you to, 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 to see it because you say you like Jerry Lewis. Okay. I, th- I just saw it. Uh, I'm fascinated by it. Apatow is really a great director and, and his, his dialogue is amazing. Yeah. If you listen to his films, whew, yeah, he really gets what people want to hear yeah. and look at. Uh, okay, so Apatow in the St- in, in the King of Staten Island, this guy I, I forgot his name, some of the Peterson I think is his name. Pete Davidson, uh, he's a stand-up uh, comedy guy. Pete Davidson, yep. Pete Davidson, mm-hmm. Pete Davidson. Yeah. Well, I I watched his stand-up on HBO, and it wasn't much. It was okay. I mean. He had a fresh approach and that he was talking about his parents and, you know, his life. But it was so Staten Island street that mm. he was breaking new ground, even though a lot of people are street. They're now um, cliche street. now. it's it's cliche street What you hear, you know, they're talking about, you know, hey, because of hip hop, hip hop mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and ska and all that stuff. Uh, so they're really imitating the black experience, most white comedians and most black comedians. They're trying to be hip and street. Mm-hmm. Pete Davidson is real. He's street. He's real. Yeah. I mean, you just can tell by the, the, the way he talks, man. He's not kidding around. Mm-hmm. But he's okay. However, the movie is brilliant. The movie is brilliant because Apatow took his uh, monologues and made a movie out of it. So he he. And then, you know, finessed them and, and, and did some writing, some real writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing against Pete. He's fine. Mm-hmm. But the reason I want to ask you is, okay, so I'm watching the movie. Now, I watched it three times already, and I'll keep on watching it. Oh, Just, wow. Okay. It's very, to me, it's a very teachable movie to me. Okay. I learn shit. Mm-hmm. Um, Pete Davidson's acting. I kept on watching it saying, wow, if Jerry Lewis was a really good actor and kept at it, Mm -hmm. he would be Pete Davidson. Or Pete Davidson has taken Jerry Lewis to a whole new level that he should have been at when he was back in the day when Jerry Lewis was Jerry Lewis. He has those eyes and the timing of Jerry Lewis, but so low key, Mm. so street, so down low that it's amazing to watch because it's totally it's totally real yeah he's not acting i'm I'm watching this three times i'm trying to catch him acting yeah did you so ever watch my, the- my question to you would be if, if you watch it mm-hmm. do you see any relationship to jerry lewis at all although i would hope that nobody in the audience ever makes that decision because i grew up and got over jerry lewis mm. But now he is like, you know, the third or fourth generation of where bonk, he he locked in. Yeah. 
Pete Davidson rocked it. Okay. So I just that's a question I'd like to ask you. Yeah. If someday when we it. meet again, I'll ask you. I'll ask you. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll watch it. Um because that's where I think Jerry Lewis should have gone when he was like 35. He should have went okay. where Pete Davidson is now. Did you ever see The King of Comedy? Excuse with, me. Did you ever see The King of Comedy? King, with, oh, yeah, man. Now Jerry Lewis was great yeah. in that. And so was that the girl. Yes. The woman comedian. Yes. That's it. No, that was brilliant. But That's that was Scorsese. Movie. Yeah. That yeah. was Scorsese. Yeah, it, it, you don't it wasn't let anybody. Uh, yeah. I mean, Scorsese will get a, 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 um, a performance out of anybody. I mean, yeah. he's a genius. Did you watch Scorsese. Jerry's Jerry's last film he ever did? It was called Max Rose. It came uh, out. I in think I tried to watch it. It was written by a kid who wanted to do it about him and begged Jerry to do it. And Jerry finally did do it. I think so. Um, I think so. I I, uh, I I don't know about it, but I think the last thing I saw of Jerry Lewis, I was very disappointed. I think mm. I did see Max Rose. Mm. I just didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't Jerry, and it wasn't Scorsese. It yeah. was just bad. It was think, amateurish, maybe. I I think the I think the the problem that Jerry ended up having was that. I think he was still trying to do the zany, goofy nine-year-old yeah, yeah, when yeah. he got too old, that it was right. no longer funny, but it yeah, started to get a little creepy. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's what I'm talking about. But I'll tell you what, though. I mean, he's he he was a, a machine. No, no, I mean, yeah. You know, I love Jerry. Yeah, the stuff that I watched when I was growing up and yeah. thought it was great. Yeah, because he you can't get that zany. No, no. <laughs> just, just, and keep it real. I mean, yeah. you you believe that he was that zany, the, yeah, the oh, character. Yeah. Oh yeah. But but and, then if you watch him talk in interviews, he's the most calm, calm Oh yeah, calm. yeah. You know, it was crazy. Um uh, to, to see the difference. But um so so what has been your favorite role? that you've played if you can narrow it down i mean you have i look oh have i have over 214 credits on imdb alone yeah. you know but is there is there one role that really sticks out to you or one character that really sticks out to you sometimes jones the first film short i made the one mm -hmm. i got the academy award that character i was playing okay it's my favorite um Escape from Alcatraz, Charlie Butts yes. is my favorite, right up there with uh, sometimes Jones. That that's probably if I had to pick out my best role, where mm -hmm. where I thought I did the best job as an actor in a movie, mm -hmm. it's Escape from Alcatraz. And the reason for that is I was so relaxed around those two guys, those two geniuses. Yeah. Clint Eastwood. I don't know if Clint Eastwood was a genius, but he's really up there. I mean, mm -hmm. he knows yeah. what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, Don Siegel is also one of the greats. So I had such awe that I didn't care. I just wanted to audition. I didn't care if I got the role, just auditioning for either of those two guys. But when I got the role, I was so filled with awe. But I was there for three months on on Alcatraz. Wow. That the awe just wore off because they're such human beings. They're just such a real people yeah. they're not stars at all except if you get on the wrong side of them then they pull their rank yeah and then, then you look out <laughs> because they can do that they can pull their rank yeah uh the one guy was fired while i was there so that's why i was hired i think because mm. somebody was fired because i heard um it, when i was auditioning for Don Siegel, he said, they said, um, what what role? It was just me and two people. Miriam Doherty, Marion, Marion Doherty, I uh, can't remember exactly her name or first name, Marion, Miriam Doherty, and Don Siegel and me. Three chairs facing one another in the middle of an empty black room. I don't know what the black room was for. It looked like they would somebody had been developing photographs in this mm. room. It was no windows, just black room, yeah. lights, and three chairs, and that was the audition room. Okay, but uh, I heard them say, uh, Don Siegel to her, as I was sitting there right in front of me, they would, that's the, the weird thing about stars though, that I never could get over, that when you're there, you're not there. 
Oh. If Don Siegel and my scenes were always with Clint Eastwood mostly. Mm -hmm. And it was just me and me and Clint sometimes. And Don Siegel would come up and he would talk to Clint Eastwood like I wasn't there, neither of them. I would be standing, you know, five inches from their faces or whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah. in a group. And they would like I wasn't there at all. And I was starting to get bugged after a while, for three yeah. months. But it calmed me down because uh, that was just a passing thing that I noted. And, and I used it to my yeah. advantage. But, but, but you lost some of the shock and awe, right? I yeah. lost it. And I was so relaxed because three months, I've never been on a movie for three months. That that was my home. I was just like, you know, hanging. I was hanging in Alcatraz. <laughs> for three and months. And so I just, you know, my character was... Uh, an outlier, just, uh, you know, he was like m me as a freshman in high school. That's what I was playing. Mm. Uh, and, I, you know, nobody liked me. I was tall. I was gawky. I was hunched over. I was shy. Uh, but I was funny. Yeah. So I was accepted, but on the, on the fringe. And then one day, some guys tried to beat me up because I was talking to his girlfriend, you know, some, <laughs> some gang member. <laughs> And he tried to beat me up. He tried to start a fight. You know, hey, hey, what are you doing talking to? Hey, man, you know, that the shoulder thing. Oh, yeah. The shoulder thing. <laughs> and I, I got a crowd around me, well, around us, because, oh, man, a fight. He's going to beat up Hank. And, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they all knew me because I was a funny guy. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, my pictures was in the, you know, from last year, funniest Larry Hank. Oh, that's Larry Hank. And so I had a crowd and, uh, the girl broke it up. The girlfriend that I was talking to, his girlfriend, you know, don't beat him up. Don't beat him up. Leave him alone. And I'm thinking, let him beat me up. I can't take a girl sticking up for me. You know, please go away. I just said, no, let us fight. Let us fight. I can't beat him up. I knew that. They said, no. But three, four days later, here's where the funny shit gets paid off. Three days later, this guy, this gang member, comes into the lunchroom. We didn't hang out at this. We, we didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. I see him over there. and I, His arm, he's, his arm is in a sling. I go, oh, what happened to him? He was going to beat me up, you know. I say, yeah, we know, my friends say. What do you mean you know? How do you know? It's all over, man. Uh, well, you know, uh, I guess he's not lucky. He says, no, no. Um, a couple of your friends, because uh, they were there. Mm -hmm. A couple of your friends, uh, confronted him and they said i heard i hear you try to beat up uh larry yeah so what I said well we're here to beat you up <laughs> and they beat the shit out of him <laughs> that's what that's what they broke his arm oh my gosh wow yeah so i was thinking that you know when <laughs> when richard pryor said was busted for for drugs you mm -hmm. know and he, he did he did time yeah uh somebody said you know how how was it in in the joint and he said, man, I just kept them laughing, man. I didn't want to be anybody's girlfriend. No, and yeah. I, uh, I thought, oh, that's, that's payback. It's if you're funny, bad guys will protect you. Yeah. And that's what happened. I was a funny guy. And they said, you fucking leave him alone. Bam. Wow. Nobody ever touched me. It was, uh, luckily, it was my senior year. But I, I wish they would have showed up when I was a freshman. But, yeah. Uh, so I thought, <laughs> I, no, that's pretty cool, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is cool. That is cool. Uh, so, so uh, Escape from Alcatraz, uh, Sally's Diner, Old Joe. Those are the the three biggies. Mm -hmm. And then, only because he's so popular, is uh, Mr. Heckles. Mm. Uh, I like only because he's popular. I mean, he's all over the world. Mr. Heckles is all over the world. It, it's weird, uh, a little too weird, uh, uh, but. Okay, uh, but but the the other one that I really loved, and they're all I no one is right. Those are the four: okay. Sally's Diner, Escape from Alcatraz, Old Joe, and Tom Pepper from Seinfeld. I hmm. loved doing him because he was so passive aggressive. <laughs> I don't want to hear any, anything about any more dried fruit. I, I just love being that angry, but but not physical. You know, yeah. I'm going to rip your heart out and stuff it down your throat. I just, you know, just it was just so cool to be able to do that in on a on camera. Yeah, I don't know. It just. 
it's a small part. It, yeah, know. but but yeah. but but sometimes those those types of parts are the are the ones that you can have the most fun with. Yeah, because... yeah, it was just pure fun. Yeah, and, and the and the other thing was that I did get directed by uh, uh, Larry David. Oh man, which was a treat. Yeah, because one, I think he's a, he's a genius, even though he's he's oh, not yeah. in my ballpark. I mean, I, I can only watch him for so long. But the guy's a genius. I mean, there's no question. For sure. And he is funny. And he knows yeah. what's funny. Okay, so um, I wanted to be directed by him because he kept on, during the week of rehearsal, he kept on directing his regulars. You know, mm -hmm. Costanza and Seinfeld and the whole, all those regulars. So I was becoming, again, jealous or miffed. <laughs> Man, why isn't he directing me? I'm funny, you know? Because the thing was, it worked. Every time he would call him over to the side, which was kind of nice that he would do that. He said, I want to talk to my, uh, I want to talk to uh, 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 Michael. I want to talk to Michael. Yeah, Michael. Okay, okay, cool. And then Michael would go back, and then Michael would be funnier. Mm. It's like, it's like the guy knows what's funny. Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking, why isn't he doing it to me? And finally, one day it happened. Uh, the, the day we were shooting, I think, or the day before. Anyway, he says, uh, I want to talk to, he doesn't direct, a guy named Tom, coincidence, a guy named Tom directs, but he stands on the side, Larry, and he just watches. And then he says, hey, Tom, I want to talk to, you know, Michael, I want to talk to Larry, you know, and he says, all right, cut, you know, and he goes over, he talks to him, and he says, okay, go ahead. And then he directs. So he, he says, I want to talk to Larry. And I'm like, oh, man, he's going to come talk to me. He's going to get a direction. Great. Yeah. Now, my setup for my backstory, you know, what I had in my mind about Tom Pepper was I said, okay, he's passive aggressive. I think he's more passive than aggressive. He just holds it in until he can. Is uh, uh, Buster Keaton. I want to do Buster Keaton. Mm. I want to be blank. I want to hold it in. I want to, Only when I get mad will I, I let it out. But it, I just want to. Nothing. I just want to be nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. And he comes over and he says, I want to talk to Larry. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. What? So he says, um, and he leans into me like really interested and really secretive. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, I know what you're trying to do. And he said it with such a smarmy, challenging. And the word that pissed me off was trying. Yeah. I know what you're trying to do. So I gave to him, guys, I can, even though I loved him and I wanted to be in the part and everything like that, I didn't care if I get fired. I said, fuck it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to talk to me that way. <laughs> so I said, oh, really? What am I trying to do? He said, you're trying to do nothing. And I was so blown away that he caught me dead right. <laughs> trying to go, oh, right, you're right. You know, all of a sudden like, he became this fan again. <laughs> oh, you're right, yeah. I'm trying to do nothing, he said. Well, you're doing something. And he walked away. And I thought, that's a great direction. <laughs> he just pinned it and walked away. Didn't yep. no instructions, nothing. He just said, Well, you're doing something. And he walked. I thought, wow, man, I'm fan for life. Fan yeah. For life. Yeah. Uh, so then so I thought, oh man, I, I can even do less. I mean, he even gave me license to do more of what I wanted to do. Yeah. That was. That was the kick of it. That's so I the do dream. it again, and I see him coming towards me, and I go, oh, fuck, now I'm pissed. Because <laughs> what did I do wrong now, man? Yeah. You know, don't. Don't spoil this. Yeah. <laughs> and he starts walking to me, but he's walking too fast. So I see, ah, he's not coming to me. He's coming to somebody behind me. And mm. as, I wa as he walked by, he just whispered in, in my ear as he walked by, he said, you're still doing something. <laughs> 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 guy's great man yeah guy's great that stuff is a dream but i was cool for the rest of the shoot man I yeah just, well, well and me a destruction well and what's funny is is i was i because i was looking back at those scenes and i was i was looking back at like um you know because you in essence you were filming um to to kind of give some context your character was playing kramer in the pilot episode of jerry seinfeld's show right um and so and I was watching that and I noticed and I and I I hadn't really ever noticed it before until I had seen more of his work that Jeremy Piven played George Costanza. Right. Um and I had never noticed that before. Oh that that he looked like Costanza? Well no that he looked like him but I I didn't realize it was him 
until oh, 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 because, oh, because, oh, because when wow, I had seen man. that, because when I had seen that, I had I had no knowledge of Jeremy Piven before. Oh, and then right. later on, after I'd seen Entourage, after I'd seen Mr. Selfridge, a lot of Jeremy right. Piven's work, I went back and looked, and I was like, what? Like that's Jeremy Piven. That's that's interesting that you say that because when I did it. Mm-hmm. The, the show with Jeremy Pivens, we were all unknown actors. Jeremy Pivens, I'd ne- never seen Jeremy Pivens before, but yeah. I did go up to Jeremy Pivens and say to him, Hey, dude, you're a real fucking great actor, man. Yeah. And I just said, like, great. Years later, when he, you know, became Jeremy Pivens, I said, Hey, man, I can, I can pick out people. I picked yeah. him out, you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I knew he was, that guy had something, man. Yeah, yeah, he's good. I don't he's think good. he believed me though when I said it to him on the set of No. Seinfeld. No, he reacted like really weird, like, you know, what do you want? Oh. You know, I said, No, you're really good, man. I mean, I didn't do it like in his face. I mean, I yeah. just but I I I wanted to to tell him if he didn't know. Maybe he knew and you know, I don't need to know any more of that. Get out of here. I, I'm I'm better than even you think. Maybe oh. that's what he was thinking. Yeah, maybe, maybe he could have been. Um, <laughs> that's funny. So, so I I do have a, a question. Is is how do you how does how does positivity play a role in your life? How how do you how do you stay positive and keep that at the forefront? If you if you think you can do it, you can do it, and if you think you can't do it, you probably can't. Not that you can't do. Not that you are not able. Mm-hmm. but that you can't everything goes in accessing it is really difficult yeah. so you probably can do it you just don't believe that you can and if you don't believe that you can you're probably going to fuck up mm. so it's best that you believe you can do it and fail than if you don't believe you can do it and fail mm. uh, I, I mean uh, it's you, you got to believe if you don't believe um no, nothing happens if you don't uh, but it's got it's not it's not like um rote you know r o t e rote you, you it's not that belief mm-hmm. it's it, what am i talking about it's not what these guys who you know attacked the capital mm. they believe but it's not what i'm talking about that's yeah. belief yeah what is that it's rote that's uh there's a word for it. I don't know what the word is. Mm. You know, uh, you know, the true a true believer. Yeah. Uh, Eric Hoffer wrote a book called The True Believer. It's a great book, but it's about these these people. It's about these people, those people, mm-hmm. all of them. Even he wrote it in fifty seven or sixty. Oh wow! But it was the same thing. It was a, a, a true believer, and he and what he said was, and this is why I'm not talking about that. What he said was a true believer. What is a true believer? A true believer is somebody who can be convinced of the opposite pretty soon. Mm. Mm -hmm. A true believer is somebody who wants to believe. They don't care what they believe in. They just want to believe. They need something to believe. Yeah. So if you give them something to believe in, they will believe it. Uh, so he was said the perfect example was it's easier to change a Nazi into a Jew or a Jew into a Nazi than it is to turn a normal people, a normal person into something that he isn't. Mm. A true believer has, has something missing. Yeah. He has a center missing, a true believer. The, the one I'm talking about, those mm-hmm. people. Yeah. There's something missing in them. Yep. And they need a fulfillment like religion. Yeah, religion. Religion is good, but not the way it's being used or practiced in modern days. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have, uh, at, at the end of every show, I have I have this segment called The Goods, and they're just some no, of the- No, this can't quote, end. Quote, this unquote, can't, questions. no. Well, with these questions, they'll, they'll, be, uh, they'll be some- Oh, oh these, are, these are show enders. Okay, let's these, go. These are, these, these are some good questions. And so, and I know I I uh, brought this up before we started recording, but what is your favorite movie of all time and why? Oh, okay. Uh, I've been, I've been luckily I've been asked this question because I had a, I had a thing for a long time. Um, there's some okay. Um, my favorite movie of all time, all time, is a black and white mockumentary done by two 
German film school students in a film school in Germany. It It's online. You can and get it anywhere you google it it's called man bites dog uh it's a feature mm -hmm. believe it, it's a feature it's a it's a documentary a mockumentary mm -hmm. written by two uh, by three film school students for their uh graduating um essay or you know you have to make a film to, to graduate it's the final thing it's mm -hmm. their presentation and it was written by the three, three of the students. It's where their uh, combined presentation. They wrote it, and he, here's the premise, and it's just, I think, brilliant. Three film school, three German film school students are in a bar. It's just there's, it's the three film school students who wrote this. Mm -hmm. They wrote this. Three film school students in a bar. Down at the other end of the bar is a guy who's getting drunker and drunker. And he's getting louder and louder. And he's, you know, like an asshole. And and um, they go down, but they're interested in maybe he's got a story, or or maybe he's maybe we could do a film about him, you know, because they're worried about doing their final film for their graduation. Mm -hmm. So they go over to him and they say, let's just feed him drinks, get him drunk enough to maybe, you know, throw up what what's bothering him, really. Yeah. So they start buying him drinks. And talking and chatting him up. And he's getting louder and more boisterous. And he's really turning into an asshole. You know, like you might leave, but now they're determined to find out what his story is. And he finally confesses in his drunken stupor. He he confesses that he's a serial killer. And that, uh, yeah, you know. And so they, they, so they think he's kidding around. Yeah. What? <laughs> so it's a comedy, right? <laughs> Perfect comedy. Yes. It's a dark comedy. Mm, yeah. So, um, so they keep on chatting. They think maybe he's kidding. Maybe he's yeah. lying. They don't know what's going on. So yeah. they, they try to get some more information out of him. And the more information is one of the guys, they go, no, wait a minute. That person did get killed where he said, you know, in other words, it's true. This guy has some facts to his bullshit here. Yeah. So they say, well, hey, you know, we're so now they're just kidding around and they say, hey, you know, well, we're three filmmakers, you know, we could make you famous. Oh, you may make you famous. You know, well, you make a movie about you, you'd be famous. The world would know, even if you captured, the world would know about you, you know. So all they want to do is make a film, you know, they they just stuck, man. Mm -hmm. So they make, so he agrees. And the next day when they call him or meet him or, you know, when he's sober, he remembers the conversation that he's in on. It. He, he's bought in on the fame thing. He wants them. And, and he says, okay, well, we'll try it w for one. He says, I'll let you watch one. We'll see if you, if you, and, and they'll say, yeah, well, we'll see if, you know, if this is true. Mm -hmm. So he, he tells them to meet somewhere. And he kills somebody right in front of them while they're filming. Oh my God. And they stick with it. They go, holy shit, man. And they go, we got to get out of here. No, no, no. Keep filming. Keep filming. Like, no, this is a murder, man. This is a murder. And he's murdering somebody. Now they're doing it in such a way. Now I can't remember whether my creativity filled in the filming of the murder. Mm -hmm. Because I know that you know somebody's being killed, and one or two shots in the film, you see the murder. I don't know if it's the worst part or just a small part. Yeah. But they're filming a murder. Okay. And then they talk about it and they say, no, we got to go through with this. You know, I mean, we'll be famous. This is, no, this is for us. And plus, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the rest of the film, that's the setup. And the rest of the film is they follow him on a murdering spree, filming. And he, and, and he becomes bolder and bolder with his, his murders. They're becoming more and more bizarre and extreme mm -hmm. for the camera. Yeah. Because he's thinking of the audience now. Yeah. He's performing and they're getting sucked deeper and deeper into it until finally one day, well, okay, I don't want to, Go see it. That that's okay. you, you just from me telling you. You can tell how excited I yeah. am. Yeah, 
because it just blew my mind when I saw it that the, the and it's the three guys who made the film that are in the film. I mean, it's the students. Mm -hmm. So for me to be watching something that students did, that this is a student film. Yeah. And, and they're willing to go this far. Obviously, the guy's not killing people. Yeah. But yeah. the verisimilitude, the veracity, the reality that they create on film in this mockumentary mm -hmm. is amazing. So that you, how... you are, yeah, yeah. I'm just, how can they do this? How can they, uh, you, you're, you're in awe of their expertise yeah. of film, filmization, you know what yeah. I'm saying? To create the reality and, oh, I get it now. The three are, that's why I was blown away. It's the, there's three students. Mm -hmm. Two are the students. One of the students is playing the killer. Oh, okay. that's what's blowing me away. Yeah. Is the actor who's acting the killer is a jokester. Mm. Uh, the, the, the character. Yeah. He's like, ah, come on, we'll do this. We'll do that. Uh, and he's, he, the, the acting is so brilliant. For a student, A, and for just an actor to, uh, to carry it off. Okay, then let, let's get into it. Then um, th this is really weird. Es um, Escape from Alcatraz is a really great movie and, and holds up mm -hmm. into the future. And this is a weird one. I never thought I'd say this, but it's true. Okay. Um, Jaws, the movie yeah? Jaws, the first original. Yes, my mom you watch loves that is Jaws. Fucking, that guy knows what he's doing. That's a genius piece of filmmaking. Yeah. Jaws. My mom loves Jaws. Loves it. Br brilliant. And then, I don't know, a couple of, you know, Scorsese, uh, um, the boxing film. Uh, I'm a big Christopher Nolan fan. So like, like Interstellar, that's, that's my favorite. That's my favorite movie. No, I don't think time. I saw it. Like, I, um, I no, I think I did. I have to see it. Interstellar, it, it came out in 2014. It had Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway, Michael Caine, Jessica Chastain. And it was about, it was, it was a time in the future when um, basically everybody on earth was going to perish and blight had taken over. And basically there's only farmers really. And, um, and so NASA has been kind of underground and they have to try and find a place to be able to allow civilization to go on out in space somewhere else and matthew mcconaughey's character it's really a, a story about the relationship between a father and a daughter he has to leave oh, his kids to look, right i did see it to go yeah it's a and man does these, he come back he does but by the time he comes back his daughter is on her deathbed as an old woman oh right right but yeah. he's not I did old see it yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, to me uh, that to me cinematically, to me it's oh, one of okay. the most gorgeous films I've ever seen. Oh, but okay. also what I what I thought was really cool was the science they worked with a physicist named Kip Thorne who um they when they came, he had he helped come up with an algorithm or whatever to simulate what a black hole would look like so that that way they can put it they could put it in their programs and when they had a black hole on the screen um, that that's what he thought due to all the formulas and everything that that's what it would look like. Well, years later, um, NASA was able to find a black hole in space and they were able to take a picture of it and it looked exactly like wow. a black hole from Interstellar. So the science that they did for Interstellar blew my mind. Like, oh, okay. Because it was all like real and it was rooted. It wasn't this fake, you know, like, oh, well, this is what it could look like. Yeah. They really did their, their research. But, um, but yeah, just a really powerful story. And So Christopher um, Nolan directed that? Yep. He also directed okay. Inception. Uh, and Batman. Didn't he direct Batman? Yep, yep. The Batman or the uh, the Dark Knight trilogy. Yeah, he did right. Dunkirk, um, which I thought was a great Oh, movie he's as an well. incredible director. Yeah, he, so he's, he's directed a lot of films. It, it would be a dream if I could work with him. If I could be on in one of his movies, I could I could die a happy man career wise. So um well I just told you my favorite films just as a cinematic thing to yeah. watch. Yep. 
Uh, but but you're getting into di directors, and then I would have to put in Annie because I worked with John Huston, which mm. fucking that's the, that's the my the crown, you know, yeah. of, of my career just working with the man. Yeah, uh, he, he was amazing. All the great ones, I mean, I'm I'm sure Christopher Nolan in some ways, they're really cool human beings. Yeah, the the, the great directors mm -hmm. not necessarily the great actors but the great directors are cool human beings i worked with three of them uh um larry david um who, who uh see john houston there was one uh, oh john hughes he's mm. a, a, a great director a cut for comedy yeah for comedy he just knows how to shoot comedy and trains oh and trains planes and automobiles i'm sorry yes. that out. Yes. that's a favorite of mine that's yes. a, a great film so uh, yeah there's three or four what so a that great one. movie uh, john hughes uh, but but john hughes is a uh, very shy he's very he, he really? not, he's a great human being probably but uh but on the set he was very shy he didn't talk to anybody much i know he talked to his stars a lot yeah. I mean, as, as a human being, you know, just not about movies or anything like that, just as a person. But mm -hmm. I never had that a access to it. So, okay. Hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think of if there's any other movies. No, those are the, those are, the, I got to remember that because somebody's going to ask me that question again. Yeah. Yeah. Movies. Yeah. I figured that would be a common one to, you know, that. Well, no, that only, I think ask, only two, but... two other people have asked me that question. Oh, all right. Yeah, well, then I'm, well, then I'm, well, then I'm doing all right then, right? Yeah, you're doing your right. <laughs> um, so is there any sort of character that you haven't played yet that you would love to play? Uh, Emmett, Emmett Demas in a, in a real major league motion yeah. picture. Yeah. Know, Emmett. Uh, uh, there's no character that I want to play except me. Just me. Okay. That would be cool. But the, uh, the only reason I say that is because... I want to see what me is, who who me is, yeah, on screen. Uh, you know, once once you take a real person like you or me, mm -hmm. and just put them in a movie, the movie dictates who you think that person is, not who the person is. I mean, yeah. you if you would meet me on the street and you didn't know I was an actor, you'd come to a conclusion. Say, well, you know, I, I met him, I had lunch with him. He's a Larry Hankin. He's a da 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 da. But if you were to see me playing me in a movie, you would say I would be somebody else. You would say, oh, that guy, that guy's probably, and yeah. I don't think there would be a, a, a match. Just being in a film just gives you something. I don't know what it, it is. It, it adds a level of, uh, I think, mystique. I think it removes the level. It, it removes it, you. Yes. Comes yes. something. But, yes. but in a way, you're right. It does give you something because it removes something and replaces it with this character. You become a character. Yeah, because I think I think it, it adds a level of mystique because what ha what ends up happening is people start to look at it and go, OK, well, but I'm only seeing him in these situations. What if how would he react if I saw him in this situation? Yeah, yeah, right. You know what I mean? And And because you don't get to see that, that's when they start to draw up. Well, I bet you he'd probably do this and this based off of what I saw. Here. Yeah, right, right. Because you, it's all based on the reality you just saw and not what you exactly. don't know. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's like I had heard um, who was I was I saw an interview with. I can't remember who it was, but they were talking about James Gandolfini. And, oh, yeah. all, and all the roles that he always played, he was always just like, hey, what are you doing? You know, hey, you, you, yeah. you know what? You know, it's just me. I'm this tough guy, mob guy, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, the the person who was talking about him had said in real life, he was much more of kind of a hippie. And he was much more of a um, like a laid back, just like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just oh, wow. well, let's go do whatever. But when you see him on screen, he's this very tough, tense, like, what do you, you know, you, you trying to mess with me kind of guy. And um, when in reality, this guy had said, he goes, he was the complete opposite. Well, I've, I've heard that about other famous actors where they say, well, he's a pussycat in real life. Yeah, Not yeah. Not that way at all. But I guess really tough people looking, mm -hmm. very tough looking people don't have to worry so much because just their look makes people not want to fight with them. Yeah. So yeah, they have the 
the opportunity to just be relaxed all the time. Yeah. Whereas uh, me, it took me years to become relaxed in my own skin because I was always uptight about something. Mm. You know, uh, maybe it goes back to my father in my high school days and people wanted to beat me up because I was bigger than them. Hey, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and then you hold that again, you take it all take in, it all in. Yeah. and there's nothing. I said, I'm amazed at some of the things I know that I didn't know that I knew until I blurted out in a conversation. Yeah. I think it's what you were saying. Yeah. And I go, oh, wow, it's amazing that, and then I think, oh, that was something. Yeah. Like your dad. There's something somebody said years ago, or sometimes I don't even know where I picked that up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, like, so this, this past summer, um, I mean, filming and everything, there was nothing going on. Right. And, um, at least for, for myself. And so just, in, just in a way to try and make some, I wanted to make some extra money and I was doing landscaping all summer. Right. I had no landscaping experience whatsoever, but I would show up and people would ask, can you do this, this, and this? And in my head, I would know, oh yeah, I have to, I have to do this. I have to do this and this. And I think about it, I'm like, where the hell did I get any of that? Because I, didn't, <laughs> I never did it when I was a kid. Right. But then well, I remember my father doing it, me watching oh, him do it. Or he would right. tell me, I would ask him, well, why are you doing that? And he would say, oh, because of, you know, because if you don't lay this down, then weeds start coming up. And so the mulch and weeds start coming through the mulch and blah, blah, blah. One time, maybe I asked him that, you know what yeah, I mean? And it's, also, it's also that... Um, you know, I know that a lot. My subconscious guides me a lot and yeah. when I don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And in, in your instance, I would say if I was in that position, you know, my father told me this years ago. I didn't remember it. Now I'm a landscaper. And all of a sudden this comes out. Uh, I would also think, you know, one of the conclusion that you came to. Mm -hmm. But I also could come to the conclusion that you know, I could have taken any job, but the fact that somewhere in here, I know about landscaping a little, yeah. might better take the landscaping job as opposed to that job. And yeah. you don't even know why you're choosing it. You're <laughs> yeah. thinking, oh, it's free will, you know. <laughs> but because I've done that with uh, where I was in a certain situation, and I think, man, yeah, it was back in my, I chose this because my subconscious knew I'd be better at this than that. Mm. So I did, I made the right choice, yeah. but not for the right reason. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's interesting. I think it's, I think it's, um, I mean, and I'm not saying that in your instance, but it can be an instance. Most definitely. Yeah. You know, I, that, I, that's I think you're right. Saying. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think I know, I think I know the answer to this now based off of some of the stuff that you had said earlier, but do you enjoy performing live or on camera more? Um, I, I, no, I, I enjoy more performing. So if I can perform on a stage, I'm there. If I can perform in front of a camera, I'm there. What I don't like is the bullshit and other things besides bullshit that you have to go through to get in front of a camera as opposed to getting on stage. It's easier to get on stage, yeah. but you have to audition and you have to drive somewhere and you have to drive back and maybe you have to audition again and you have to memorize lines and you have to be in front of strangers and be judged. And then you have to get uh, instructions from the director if he doesn't like what you're doing because he wasn't there for the audition because it was a sitcom and they're not there for those. So it's just a, a, a rat race and a runaround for movies. Whereas I can get on a stage, I can get on a stage tomorrow there wasn't COVID. Yeah. Uh, but I, but even if there wasn't COVID, I couldn't get on the stay uh, in front of a camera lens tomorrow, unless I hired somebody to come over or go there. Yeah. So that's the only difference, but I enjoy when I'm in front of a lens, something happens that's magic that I can't figure out. Yeah. In, in, in within me that I, I just get turned on. I, that's you I point the too. camera at me and you say, yeah, there's film in here. Um, I can do shit that I, can't do if you don't point the camera at me yeah i mean not much different but i remember but it, a, it does do something a, a um a common note i used to get 
when I was doing musical theater was, um, and I, and I love, and I loved him for it because my, our, our, my director that I had, he would sit in the very back of the auditorium while we're rehearsing and he would just yell up there because he would know what I was trying to do. And he was, he would know what I was doing just because he knew me well. And he would say, I'm back here. I can't see what you're doing with your face because I, I, I like the subtle things. I like right. the subtle movements, the eye, you know, the yeah, that's thing, a, work with movie your actor. eyes. And, <laughs> yes. And so he would just yell. He's like, I can't see you, you know? And, and so that would, oh, okay, well, I gotta be bigger. I have to be bigger. And then I got to film and yeah, the problem, I started doing bigger. And a director that, come over and said, hey, uh, so the frame, you, you just you just have a, it's a close-up. So you don't have to go crazy. Yeah, right. Like, oh, okay. And so I started doing the subtle things, right? I started reverting right. back to some of the subtle things. I went to watch playback and I looked and I was like, oh, I'm home. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it would yeah, just, right. it felt, it felt right. And it felt, um, I felt comfortable. And from that day on, I mean, I, I get, obviously get nervous still, you know, because I get excited and antsy, but um but yeah, when if there's a camera running and I'm, you know, uh, and I'm in the shot, I'm comfortable and I, I can, you yeah, know, I exactly. Said, I can do more than uh, than I was able. Uh, so it's it's the same with with me, and I don't question it, but I don't know what, what what's going on, you know. Yeah. But, but I don't question. It. Um, yeah. So, but but they're totally different trips. Yeah. You know, sure. stage and and movies. Uh, they're they're totally different pieces of, of show business are like two different businesses mm -hmm. one is you're dealing with people and you're talking to them and it's one-on-one -on -one. and the other you're doing it in bits and pieces you, you know you, you know it's not a one long line an hour and a half play yeah it, it's it's you know bump bum now you know and you can do it out of order so oh i did i'm shooting this today but in the script i did that before I did what I did yesterday, mm -hmm. and you got to keep track of all that. Yeah, it's totally. It's two different businesses. I thought they were the same. Most people do. That's what you first thought. Yeah, you know, they had to calm me down too. I was way over the top. You know, well, I'll bring you down. You know, uh, no, no. Oh, one time I got a, a note from somebody who said a director, a sitcom director, who said to me in the audition, "I was a callback," and he said, "I saw you in the callback." You were a little too big, so what no, he said, you're a little too low key. Bring it up. He said, for this audition, he came out. He came out into the waiting room. Where are the actors? Wow. And he spoke Jeez. to me. Yeah. He said, Look, in this audition, I want you, you were kind of low key in the other audition. For this audition for these people, I want you to bring it up and don't worry. I'll bring you down in performance. And then he went back into the room and I didn't listen to him. I didn't believe him. If they tell you to bring it up and you bring it up, that, that's what you're going to do. You're yeah. going to bring it up. And if they tell you, don't worry, worry. They're lying. Yeah. <laughs> it's very simple. It's like politics. The bold face lie right to your face. The bold face <laughs> lie. Except in the, in the process and in, in the case of a great director. Yeah. They're telling you the real deal. Yeah, and you have to decide. And I decided this guy wasn't the real deal. For him to come out and tell me that, why didn't he tell me that in the first audition? Yeah. He saw me. You know, I, I just, I don't know. I have a sixth sense. Maybe it's a bad sixth sense, but I, I go with my sixth sense. Well, I just didn't believe like it, the guy. It seems like it's. And I well. oh, I didn't get the job, and I'm very happy. Oh, in, in other words, I made a choice. It's my yeah. choice. I didn't bring it down. He told me to bring it up. I didn't. My choice. Fine. Cool. Yep. N nothing. Nothing wrong. And you move on to the next. Yeah. Moving on. Um. <laughs> so, my final question. Uh oh. Okay. Is what are some ways that you keep yourself centered? Whoa. Okay, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um. Well, I don't. Uh. No. I mean. Uh, <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I ride my bike okay. regularly. Um, I, I try to uh, not think about 
what I'm thinking about all day, which is, you know, show business, my part, my writing, my this, what's next, you know, the what, what I have to do, what's what I have to do tomorrow. I try to block that out in, in, in some way, go for a long walk or um, I smoke a doobie, hmm. you know, that'll calm me down. Yeah. Uh, but but um, I don't, I used to do it a lot more, but very rarely because I don't, I don't like the, uh, the side effects now. I mean, I, I didn't, when I was young, fuck it, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, because basically uh, now, yeah, I mean, socially, I don't think it helps. This is mm. socially. I mean, I think it's yeah. a. If you have to do any kind. Yeah, you know, you're taking vitamins. You you don't take vitamins to go talk to people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so okay. I, I consider it just another vitamin. Yeah. You know, I so said if I need a vitamin, I take a vitamin. If I'm low on iron, I need to go to the grocery store today. Uh. Well, if I go to grocery, store, no, I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, I have to deal with, I, or we're on the phone. I don't answer the phone. Yeah. Uh, or, or I just don't, or I just don't. I mean, yeah. uh, and I know that just uh, scientifically, as you get older, you just do it less and less and less until finally you, you, you stop. Because I think, because when I used to do it to to create, you know, I I, I don't have any thoughts I can't access. Mm -hmm. It's an access thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I can't access the right side of my brain right now. I got to write this thing. It's for tomorrow. So I'll, I'll, I'll smoke some, but cr creatively. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but now I, I find more and more this thought enters my mind. You know, I can access that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, I'm not worried. I I, yeah. I believe I can, and I and I do. I mean, I, those paintings, mm -hmm. no drugs. I mean, I didn't. It wasn't wasn't required. It wasn't needed. I didn't feel like it. I, so I you painted painting. those? Yeah, I painted both of them. Oh man! I have. Oh, by the That's way, awesome. before you go, this is your last question. Uh, the real Larry .com. I have forty of my paintings. I have T-shirts and all my film shorts, or most of my film shorts are on therealarryhankin.com or Vimeo for the film shorts. All right. But yeah, the these, my Hankin. paintings, they're all of five feet by four feet or three feet. They're big. They're Jeez. that size. Yeah. Uh, but I have oh, them on cool. T-shirts too. You can get those two on T-shirts. Do you really? Oh, uh, man. I, I might yeah. have to pick myself up some some of those. Those are super. Uh, like yeah, or you can get, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that those are decaled on. Here you go. Here's one right here. This is oh, I, nice. I painted that. That's my painting. Wow! It's uh, five feet by by four four feet. It's right up here. It's right in front of me. Right in front of you. But wow! You can get them on uh, t-shirts on anything you want. Mm. On your dick, you can get them on your dick. <laughs> uh, wherever. You know. I don't do that. That's a tattoo guy. Okay, okay. Well, well, that's good to know. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Well, hey, Larry, I, I, I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show. And it was, I, I hope you had a good time. I had a great oh, time. Oh, I had a great time. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, you. you know, and I hope we can do it again. And um, a a anytime somebody, you know, drops out, you, you need a replacement. <laughs> I'll give you a call. All right. I'll so, give you a okay, call. Man. <laughs> well, Take thank you, easy. Larry. All right. And that concludes this episode of The Good Life. Thanks again for being here. I hope that you enjoyed the show. I hope you enjoyed all the stories that Larry told. Um, and I'll tell you what, it was an absolute pleasure and honor to have him on. And uh, yeah, don't forget to share this and subscribe, follow. And um, yeah, and if you like what I'm doing, let me know. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.